So it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to this Jones Seminar Series, and I congratulate those of you who found it in the different place and different time. <laughs> You're obviously a select group. Um, our speaker today uh, is uh, Dr. Zhihuang Li, and uh, I confess that his last name is easier for me to pronounce than the first name, as you might anticipate, given that my name is Li. Uh, but I've had, some, I've had some instruction on the first name, and I don't need to be graded right now, but I'm doing my best. So uh, it's a pleasure to have you uh, at Dartmouth and the Thayer School. Uh, Zhi Huang uh, got his uh, master's and doctoral degrees at Drexel University in civil engineering, but as you'll see with sort of a building science uh, flavor, and I'm sure some other elements you'll weave in for us and then is now at the Center for Green Buildings and Cities at the Harvard School of Design. And so uh, without further ado, again, we're very glad to have you with us. And uh, the floor is yours. Welcome. OK. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, especially uh, for Dr. Ning for the uh, invitation and uh, for those arrangements, and also for the coffee and uh, snacks. <laughs> And most, most importantly, thank you very much, all of you, for being here, and especially for a different time, different occasion. <laughs> um, I'm Xu Wang Li. Um, I'm a postdoc fellow at uh, Harvard University, the Harvard Center for Green Buildings and the Cities. Um, all my uh, past like, more than five or six years, my research, uh, my experience, or working experience, are um, about the building operation, building design. We use uh, building simulations to guide the building design, to guide the, not guide, to assist the building design, and to guide the building retrofitting, and also to use the models to uh, control the buildings, especially for the uh, interactions with the distributed energy systems, and also the controls, the interactions with the power grid. So. Uh, my, 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 my presentation, my speak today, will start with some background statements of what uh, problem that I'm going to solve, what kind of goals I want to achieve. And then I will uh, talk briefly, uh, quickly about my previous uh, research experience, one by one, about uh, simulations for design, for retrofitting, for uh, controls, and also for demand responses. And uh, finally, and most importantly, I think I will uh, talk, discuss a little bit about my uh, future uh, research directions and also the fundings and the uh, collaboration um, opportunities at Dartmouth and uh, over the world. Okay, uh, the first topic, uh, the first background information is about the building energy consumption. Uh, as you know, I may not know, the building consumes 70% of electricity and also 40% uh, of the primary energy in U.S. So, which, uh, so the DOE or the governments are pushed very hardly forward for the building energy saving. So we, um, pe uh, the governments now push forward the building with the smart grid. So however, the buildings uh, uh, perform some very critical rules in that smart grid and the energy fields. Uh, first, because uh, I think one fourth of the um, electricity used at U.S. right now can be dispatched, so that means we can use the demand and response schemes to reduce the demand and reduce the cost, and also to reduce the stress for on the power grid. And uh, on the other direction, uh, the DOE and the governments push forward the net de development on net zero buildings from design, from the operation. They want uh, all the new commercial buildings uh, are net zero by 2030, and all the commercial buildings are net zero by 2050. And uh, we're going to target on this and push forward all the developments. And um, uh, my, research, uh, my research focusing on the net zero building as well as the net zero building cluster. Because we can see here, the net zero building right now is like a prototype buildings or a demonstration project. They are not very common in the typical house and like everybody live in. So because which at this point, which is very costly, uh, we need a lot of energy or efforts in the design, in the material selections, and also in the equipment design, equipment selections. So which is not that cost effective right now. 
However, uh, I think I propose a uh, net zero building cluster point that is uh, a multiple multiple buildings different to a campus. We share the uh, distributed energy systems, but different to a campus. Because the campus, we have a uh, we just have one owner. So this objective is just one single objective, which is easier. We're gonna reduce the overall energy consumption or cost. However, if you have a cluster, but each building or each devices belong to one uh, individual, so they will have their own objectives. So their, their uh, system will be two-layer optimization problem, which is uh, difficult, more, uh, more difficult. Okay. So they are not to move, uh, after I introduced the uh, background, and now move into the project backgrounds. First of all, one is about the building energy modeling for building design and for building retrofitting. I don't know whether you're familiar with the words about retrofitting. Retrofitting is for the existing building. We upgrade the design. We change or up upgrade the systems to save more energy and to improve the building performance. Okay, uh, for the for the early stage design, um, I work with architects to talk, to focus on the key parameters like the building um, orientation, like the building uh, uh, the window location or the window size, because the window is the most important for us to utilize the natural ventilation and the natural daylighting. We can add more uh, technologies for on the, on the windows or for the windows to uh, use more about natural energy and save energy and improve the uh, occupant comfort. And uh, the building energy retrofitting now is really case by case because different buildings, the existing buildings perform differently. We're gonna firstly target on the uh, points that we have potentials to save more energy and to do more work. And uh, I think different to the existing studies, my research is not just focusing on one single building. I'm targeting on a region, like the, uh, all the buildings in New Hampshire, all the buildings in uh, Massachusetts. Um, if we change this kind of, uh, we, we apply this kind of technologies or improve this performance, how much energy, how much um, um, greenhouse gas emission we can reduce. Okay, like I said, the first one we have uh, the single buildings, then we target on different buildings, residential buildings, commercial buildings, buildings for schools, for office, and also for the hospitals. Okay, and uh, the, another, another topic about my research is um, not about on the design and retrofitting, which is about the operation of the building. Because most of the building, I want to say most of the building uh, right now, even I, th I think this building, which is not operated as they designed, there are some faults, like the sick, sickness that people uh, we have. So we are acting uh, like a doctor for the building. We detect the faults and diagnose the faults and then give suggestions how to fix them. And um, how much energy or what kind of performance you can expect if you fixed that. Uh, so, for, so in, in order to do that, uh, Harvard, um, me, uh, McConnell and me are developing a, a uh, overall and a comprehensive building automation, building monitoring, fault detection, and a control uh, tool. Um, here, we, what we, we, firstly, we can monitor the building operation, how much energy it consumes comparing to different buildings in this range at Harvard. And, um, we also can monitor, monitor all the detailed um, sensors, meters within that building to infer some faults or some um, bad uh, malfunction of the controllers. We also, uh, we also can, add, can give the occupants more freedom to check the building uh, performance and to give their suggestions or complaints. Then we're gonna vote, and then we can change the distributed control uh, algorithms uh, accordingly. So, this figure in the bottom, I don't know whether you can see that clearly, which is a, uh, we call that as our housing, uh, net zero housing project that we are doing right now, uh, which is a deep retrofitting project. 
on that, we have um, we we want to we have we, we're going to implement uh, use this um, monitor, monitoring and control systems, and also for the sensors, we're going to include uh, the variable sensors from the occupants and uh, to really target on the occupants because the building is built for people, and. Um, also, another kind of sensors that nobody is doing right now, we are trying to de develop the uh, mobile sensor, which is can similar like uh, you, you uh, deploy all the all different kind of sensors on, the, on a robot. So the robot can work through the building or to, can even uh, work within the docks, I mean, uh, within the docks here in the docks. They can collect all the data. So after we get all the data, firstly we can detect the faults for the sensors, for the, all those monitor sensors, and also we can use that data to detect uh, the faults in the actuators, in the controllers. And then we can improve, like uh, first we act as a doctor, and then we act as a like, uh, uh, body building trainer to improve the, the performance of the building. Okay. Now, uh, move to another direction uh, for the building cluster and the building interactions with the power grid. Because that is, um, the building is a very, very important part at the demand side of the power grid. So how the building reacts with, to the, interact with the power grid should do the demand response. Um, my research is focusing on the uh, building cluster, as I mentioned, not single building. As the building, like the building cluster, there are uh, three buildings or even more. You can add more and more because I develop a freedom, flexible uh, test bed, we can, which can add more buildings, more systems easily. And there are buildings and uh, distributed energy generation, like PV panel, battery storage systems, and also the thermal energy storages. Because um, I don't know whether this is uh, very f uh, familiar to you guys or not, but the thermal energy storage, which is very common for buildings, because we if buildings need cooling. This store the cooling, it store energy as as chilled water, like cold water or ice. So that is very common. So how to inter uh, connect with them and how to come up with a controller optimized control system to really optimize the operation of the building cluster to reach to a net zero state status or the most energy efficiency uh, status. Okay. So however, in order to develop this kind of, I, I, uh, this, first this emission is new, and how to develop, realize this, first one, we lack, we don't have the building cluster uh, test bed or simulator. We can simulate, we can apply different strategies on. So uh, the second one is there is a lack of uh, high fidelity models for this kind of uh, cluster. We have models for buildings. We have models for um, the distributed energy systems. However, those, those models are individual models. The, how to connect them, how to allow them to share the information, to share resources, which is a challenge. So my research are targeting on those uh, two uh, points as well. Okay, now let's move to the uh, first topic about the building and the simulation uh, for the building design and for the building retrofitting. Okay, uh, first one, uh, if, we, if we want to build a, like a simple building, a uh, very small building, the most important factor that we, uh, as engineer, we, we, we uh, consider the first one is the envelope envelope uh, system, the insulation of the envelope, the thermal capacity of the envelope, because the thermal capacity can store the energy, the thermal energy, cooling or heating at light or, and, uh, and uh, release that during the day. And an, uh, another one is the window to wall ratio. As I said, the window, the window size, window location for natural ventilation and for the uh, solo for the solar radiation, for the delighting and uh, the passive solar heating. Is that. And uh, uh, for, for the equipment side, the lighting system gonna collaborate with, together with the natural ventilation, how to develop the uh, lighting system and uh, how to control them. 
And another one is the plug loss uh, for the demand response or for the energy efficiency. And uh, on the other hand, for uh, incorporating the energy, uh, building energy systems like the HVAC systems, which are more uh, like uh, system by system, because different system has different characteristics. We have different works to do. So. Uh, Um, in order, f in order to realize this kind of tool, and to do that, so firstly we're gonna identify the parameters from the act act, and so we're gonna evaluate that theoretically, and we can uh, get some real measurement from the real field to develop some uh, models to, for, uh, either to uh, to consider the uncertainty and consider the energy performance. Then we're gonna imported that into the energy simulation models, either physical-based or data-driven models. Then we're going to consider the output of energy consumption. We can use that to inform the decisions, either for uh, uh, design, either for the operation. Okay. And uh, as I mentioned, I'm targeting on the uh, overall the region, not single building. Uh, after I have those kind of uh, information from the measurement or from the survey data, we imp uh, imported everything into all kind of, like thousands or hundreds of simulation models. We uh, simulated them. We um, uh, uh, output, uh, output the results of the energy consumption, energy use in terms of uh, against the first cost. We have this like a frontier for for those kind of cost benefits. Then we categorize all different options, like lighting uh, or the uh, window. We categorize that into different options. We um, suggest the architects or the uh, engineers to um, adopt the options in this, in this range, because we have less energy consumption and less first cost. Okay. Uh, for that project, we did that for uh, Philadelphia region. We uh, fo focus, uh, fo ma majorly focus on the envelope, especially for the window and external wall, uh, especially for the roof and the window and the uh, HVAC system, because the, there are some uh, the HVAC system design and control strategies. And um, from the, this chart, we can see, uh, not, not I can introduce, uh, usually we can easily realize like 25% reduction energy consumption. And our goal, uh, ultimate goal, was ambitious. We can reduce the 50% of any building energy consumption in Philadelphia. But we can easily, without any like, trouble, to re realize 25% of the overall building energy consumption in Philadelphia. OK, uh, are there any questions regarding this project? Otherwise, I will move on to the second one. OK. Yeah. Okay, I will introduce that in the later slide because that's another project for the fault detection. Is that okay? Okay, thank you. Uh, no, right now. <laughs> um, the second one is about the energy system, the fault detection, and uh, the optimal control. Like uh, we have act as doctor and uh, body build trainer. And uh, for in order to, uh, I can back to your question. There, uh, there are multiple faults um, for the building. Uh, especially you have sensors. Sensor has like malfunction sensor, like dr sensor drifting, sensor bias, which gonna affect your control strategies. And some, also some actuator uh, faults, like the damper, which is stuck, which cannot close, uh, fu fully close, fully open. And also some valves similar to the dock, you cannot uh, close and you cannot react uh, responsibly. So. Uh, in order to detect them, firstly, I, um, on the simulation, I develop a, a test bed to simulate the faulty cases and the free cases to uh, to consider and to consider the the differences. And this is a whole overall uh, building HVAC system like model. We have fans, chillers, ducts. And then we evaluate the, uh, this model against the experiment data. Then using this uh, simulation tool and the real measurement data, we develop the uh, 
fault detection model, which is a pattern matching based using uh, PCA method. Because um, we the building measurement, there are hundreds of uh, measurements. We if we put everything together, they will there will be a huge, huge matrix, like hundreds by hundreds matrix. How can we, uh, it's, it is hard to do the pattern matching using that huge matrix. So we use the PCA method to decrease the dimension to find out the key components in that matrix. So as I mentioned, we calculate the uh, PCA uh, similarities factors, and then we compare the uh, factors with the with the sensor data, snapshot data, with the real uh, measurements, if this kind of uh, measurements outside the threshold of the um, threshold, we can alarm there might be a fault. This is how we do the fault detection. If you can see this result here, uh, at this uh, plus, there are just like a, um, not too many points outside of this threshold, and um, we say this might be a fault-free case. But you can see here there are a lot of points outside of the threshold. We say this situation is fault. How, um, until here, we can detect this fault. We can say, here, there is a fault. Like, like a doctor say, you have sick. But the doctor needs to tell you which kind of uh, sickness you have. That comes with the uh, fault diagnostics. So how can we do the diag uh, fault diagnostics? And, uh, um, we use first we use the uh, rules and uh, predict prediction models and the, the basic uh, the basic classifiers. If you how much you divert from your uh, uh, prediction and the, from the correct uh, situations, and then we get a like a possibilities for this kind of faults. Then we use the basic networks to really to consider. Uh, pro, uh, probabilistically to uh, target on the single fault. And uh, the final result here will not, for, from this model, will not be, hey, there 100% of this equipment is wrong. We're going to give a list, like 20% of the probability will be this, like 30% will, will be that. Like even the, for the doctors, they say there might be possibilities, they will ask you to do some, like x-ray, whatever test. So then we needed to ask the facility people to take a look at them to really compare the measurement data. And we need to narrow down the exactly faults. OK. And uh, for the optimal operation, as I mentioned uh, for firstly for the lateral ventilation, when should you open the windows? When, uh, how much should you open the windows? Which is right now, which is also a very a hot topic, but which is very hard to control the ventilation because there are a lot of randomness. Uh, the flow cannot, the, the flow will not flow like what you want. So um, what, I, what I did firstly to have some multi-objective control optimizations, we consider, simply consider the each room as one point. So we don't consider the fluid, very detailed fluid dynamics here. Uh, but that will be my future studies and then we optimized the uh, ventilation rate. And on, on, and on the other hand, about the optimal control, which is uh, what also I mentioned, the thermal mass control, because the, the thermal mass, like this desk or the wall, can absorb the heat, absorb the cooling, um, to the, uh, and store that and release that later. So how can we control that passively? Because we, we don't need to add more new equipment, which is more cost benefits. So we're going to uh, control the temperature set point. So for example, I right hear uh, at the winter, if, uh, I want to say, if we want to deal with the uh, power grid, we want to do summer because we want to use electricity. If we use the gas, it's another story. If we use electricity, we're gonna, in the summer, we're going to pre-cool pre -cool the building a little bit and uh, in, in the early morning and store that uh, cooling in the building and release that in the peak hours when the electricity price is higher. So we're going to optimize the temperature set point and really consider the energy cost and the thermal comfort, which call, we call that PMV. That's the, how people feel the comforts or not. 
Then in that project, I um, studied the different buildings and different climate zones, and uh, I got a fro uh, like um, a, a protocol uh, like frontiers, the curves for the uh, strategies with different uh, weighting factors of the uh, thermal comfort requirements. Now, back here, here is the results. I just showed uh, uh, two locations, Boston and Miami. Uh, if we take a, just take this for example, if you don't care about the thermal comfort, you can save like eighty percent of energy because you can increase the you can you can to, to to be the extreme you can just turn off the air conditioning or the heating system, <laughs> then you can save one hundred percent. But uh, if you consider more about the energy about the comforts, you can save forty percent out of out of Boston comparing with the most typical uh, control strategies, like uh, the temperature settings, which is you don't need to add any cost. You just change to the control settings. OK. And uh, the second, the third one is about the uh, mentioned the building cluster operation, test bed development, development, and the smart grid interactions. And I showed this figure before. Um, I developed, uh, developed a, a uh, simulation emulator for the building cluster, uh, for the PV panels, for the buildings, for, and for the thermal storages. This test bed right now has the capability to really to connect with the building uh, automation system using the BACnet protocol to get the data in and even to override some control logic. Uh, control variables, decision variables in the uh, in the building automation system. If we have that uh, protocol connection, and uh, in this, uh, uh, here is the details about the emulator. I want to go through that very quickly. Uh, the building models and the PV battery and the PV panel models, and also co connect the PV panel models with the building models using a virtual generator. Uh, to simulate everything simultaneously during at each step, uh, time step, and to exchange the information, share the uh, resources. Okay, now we need to. We have this emulator. Now we need to optimize the operation of this uh, building cluster. Which we have power grid. We have multiple buildings, three, four, five here, and uh, PV panel, battery. How can we can develop a uh, multi, uh, like a multi-objective function? To consider the consider the cost, we have cost and we have earnings if we sell some electricity to the grid, and we also consider the thermal comfort of the building. Uh, there are some the the rates, the electricity rates, in the electricity consumption, and uh, there here is the thermal comfort index. Okay, um, yeah. So, so the purpose of this optimization is to optimize the temperature settings, the uh, shared thermal storage op operation, like how much um, percent of the chilled water or the energy goes to the first building, goes to the se second, or goes to the third. And um, also the battery charging and discharging uh, status or schedules. Okay. And... Um, for we we want to do the simulation. We want to do the model-based uh, optimization. However, how can we do that? Why we should do that? I, I mentioned. I, I we need to develop uh, come up with those control strategies. And how can we do that? We have different models, like white box models, first like uh, very detailed physical-based models, which is very accurate. I would say if you valid, validate that very well, but which is very uh, like computationally in, uh, demanding, and uh, it needs a lot of engineering effort to develop that. So, which is not recommend, recommended right here. So, what I recommended is like a active, uh, proactive gray box model and black uh, black uh, gray gray box model and black box model. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the the model, how how I de develop those models. Um, I caught them as the active system identification, because um, right now most of the like, data-driven models we connect all the kind of information data, uh, information from the building or from the weather. However, the building usually operates like in the same uh, way, day and day. From yesterday and today, the temperature settings are 
similar. And uh, however, if we want to do the pre cooling or preheating for the demand response, the building operation st uh, stage or the range will be far away. Because sometimes right now, if in the summer, uh, the typical temperature setting will be like 70, 70 degree F. But if you want to do the uh, preheating, uh, precooling, you, you might down to the 30 degree F. So you cannot guarantee the model you're trained using the 70 uh, se temperature settings to, be the, uh, to have a good performance in that range. So that comes up with the model extendability. What I did, uh, I intentionally to add some excitations. Excitation should change, intentionally change the temperature set points a little bit, and or in the weekend to change that dramatically, to collect the more data, to guarantee the model performs better in the, uh, uh, in the um, demand response cases. Uh, so there are the results. If we don't, if I don't do the uh, model adaptive uh, and adaptation, adaptation, and after I do the model adaptation, I increase the model accuracy. Okay. And uh, for after we do, after I did the uh, active excitation, how I, what kind of model structure I need to use? I used the uh, what I call the uh, system education model. I used the physical, a simplified physical based model like the resistance and the capacitance model in the third period. And I also used the state space and data, uh, data driven models like uh, different machine learning models. And um, there are four criteria that for me to choose that kind of model or to evaluate those models accuracy, speed, extendability, which is very important, and uncertainty. I evaluate every, uh, all the models and publish the papers um, on this. And then I use those, all those models back to the um, optimization framework I showed before to determine the control strategies. And uh, for the uh, devices, uh, for the energy devices model, which is um, similar and uh, which is also more mature, because there are a lot of existing model structures that I can apply. And then what I need to do is to uh, identify the parameters. So I use different uh, physical-based uh, like parameter identification techniques. The models perform very well, the accuracy over 90%. And um, we used all, everything together to get the um, optimization results. I think I'm going to show that here. Okay. The first uh, result on the left is without considering the thermal comfort. We just the temperature, uh, set, uh, the, temp the room temperature set points will close or add or, or add the uh, upper level, uh, upper limitation, like um, settings of the temperature. And it's due to uh, pre cool the buildings. And however, if we consider the thermal comfort, the temperature will close or above uh, 24 uh, C Celsius degrees, because that, that range people will have um, better comfort. comfort. Then we, uh, I evaluate all kinds of uh, different combinations of the weighting factors for the thermal comforts and get the, all those curves. Those curves can give suggestions for the controls. And uh, yeah, we can say the, and the optimization, first the we we'll also compare that if we, those two lines are the energy cost without the distributed energy systems. Those two are with the distributed energy system. Those two are using the left y axis. Those two are using the uh, right axis. So, for uh, obviously, the, uh, we, we all know that distributed energy systems can reduce the energy cost uh, tremendously. And also the energy, uh, oper if you compare the baseline operation with the optimized operation, the, optimized, the optimization can also reduce the energy consumption, uh, energy cost uh, significantly. Okay. Now uh, the, four, the, the, the fourth one about the micro-grade and uh, distributed, en distributed energy system modeling demand response work, the UR, I, conduct, I did those research at Siemens. So we collaborate with um, companies to really develop some embedded controllers to control the battery. So to control the battery in the building and to uh, do the demand response. 
this project comes with like, uh, two phases. The first one, we call that an outer loop, is we consider the life cycle, uh, how to design the battery, what uh, capacity of the battery it is, with considering the life cycle cost and the environmental uh, uh, pollutants, how, um, what to design the battery better. And the second, the inner loop, we run the real-time optimization to, de to determine, firstly, the building set points and also the battery dispatch and the load control. And uh, we are, we develop, we have uh, prototype demonstrations on the demo, on the demo. So we have batteries and uh, some plug loads acting as a building. We have demonstrations. We are, because uh, I, uh, I did this as an intern, I left. And they are trying to, right now, they, they will try to embed them with their existing tools to really use that in the real field. Uh, another microgrid study, which is very uh, small project that we want to have a isolated power microgrid, similar to your study. We want to, because this is coming from the uh, army, from the uh, military project, we want to have a uh, isolated microgrid. How can we supply all kinds of uh, supply, uh, balance the supply and the, balance, balance the supply and the load. So we have all uh, the optimization, we formulate it as an optimization problem and uh, solve them as a um, stochastic optimization problem where it's considering the solo, which considering solo, uncertainty, solo uncertainties to do the uh, stochastic optimization to come up with the strategies for the lighting, for the, uh, for the, especially for the EVs, when to, to charge and when to, uh, when to, when to charge and how fast to charge, and also for the battery. And uh, there are also some other like more uh, like more hands-on uh, research about the building energy design, especially for the land zero house project. Um, we consider like uh, I involved in two. Net Zero House uh, project. The first one is a bamboo house that I did a few years ago back in China, which is a design uh, project. We designed this bamboo house. There are PV panels, how to really control them, how to connect them, which is like a built, built a building as an undergrad student. And uh, the second one is a Harvard, uh, called Harvard House, house Zero project, which is a deep retrofitting because the this building is an existing building. We, uh, we combine, com, uh, conduct energy simulation, uh, computational flow dynamic simulations for the natural ventilation, and also for the installation and thermal com uh, the performance, as I mentioned. And uh, of course, if we want to use the PV panels for this building and thermal, uh, geothermal for the Harvard housing project. And uh, we also involved the uh, target, because as I mentioned, the building is built for people. We do need to consider to consider the uh, occupant behaviors. So we monitor the occupant behaviors and the indoor environment qualities. So um, for we have different sensors and different uh, dashboards to control them. And uh, I also have the real building like measurements and experiment studies at different at commercial buildings, at schools and laboratory, connected with the um, real con uh, controllers and the Arduino board to deploy everything and uh, to apply uh, and to apply some control strategies. Okay, and uh, the following uh, I don't know whether it's interest uh, more interesting for the students or not, but I'm gonna go through that quickly. Um, my future uh, research will be as a building. For a building, there are only two directions we can go. The one is going out for to the power grid, to the energy uh, the field. And another direction is go inside for the building. We consider the occupants. And so the first one is about the building design and uh, co collaborative design. We're gonna consider some, uh, comprehensively of the from the act act and also from the mechanical engineer, electrical engineer to consider the building uh, shape, building design, and the system design, system op operation at the early stage 
at the first stage. We don't need to, we don't want to do the retrofitting later. And uh, on the other hand, it, the, the second one is about the occupant interactive building, built environment. We consider the uh, temperature, humidity, and uh, the light, lighting, and also the sustainability for, because people, people usually uh, will have huge uh, influence on the uh, system operation, but, but uh, especially for the residential buildings, the open windows, closed windows, and uh, turn on AC, turn off ACs. So we, um, what I want to do, we, uh, I want to collaborate with some people from the psychology field to really to find out the patterns for the people's behaviors and what kind of situations people are gonna turn on the AC, turn on the, turn, uh, t uh, open the windows. And the other, uh, the third one is a model-based adaptive control for building automation and building control. I want to say uh, the I want to focus emphasize on the uh, adaptive, because right now the buildings operate uh, operation, there are too too many uncertainties. So we're gonna adapt the models uh, simultaneously along the way for the uh, controller develop. And the other one is the fault detection I mentioned uh, as a doctor for the building. And some other uh, some other project later, if we uh, like the sustainability green green campus, and also collaborate with some people from the power grid side to how to really uh, look into the building's role in the power grid. Yeah, uh, the goal is energy efficiency and sustainability, occupant comforts, and the people's productivity. And uh, they're gonna involve different people from different disciplines. Okay, um, there are some collaboration opportunities and funding opportunities that I want to pursue in the future. For, first of, of all, uh, NSF uh, as a new faculty for the uh, early early career funding or some other uh, funding from the different program. The, uh, the other one, I think the most important one is from DOE, their uh, building technology office. And also, and also, I think Upper E is from DOE. The Upper E also uh, put forward the, this kind of research. And the NIST, National Institute of Standard Technologies. I uh, collaborated with them for my master uh, project. They have a smart grid and net zero uh, house energy uh, programs. And also some Fundings and collaboration opportunities from the industry, uh, from the uh, actually the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, Air Conditioning uh, Engineers, um, and also some national labs and some companies, industry companies, and uh, finally the universities. And uh, most importantly, I want to collaborate with the faculty members at Dartmouth at Engineering School in um, sustainable design, sustainable development, and also in the power grid sites, and uh, also for the industry uh, engineering for the system operation and for the, uh, and for the water food nexus. Okay, um, I don't know if I'm right on time or not. Uh, that's pretty much my presentation. I, any open to the questions? Now, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. In your second project that you described, it seemed like largely a detection problem. You were trying to detect um, faulty buildings, I guess, or faulty building systems. Right. Do, was there, like in any detection problem, it may be that you want to consider the type one and type two errors, and they might have differing costs. Exactly. Exactly. Was that a consideration? Yeah, it is the consideration. Help you prioritize which kinds of faults you'd be most interested in. Right. Care. Right. We do consider that in the study, like the fossil alarm, right? The detection rate and the fossil alarm, but we. Um, we, I don't, I, I cannot say which part we consider more, but we usually we decrease the uh, fossil alarm to uh, below like ten percent, because that if you have fossil alarm, the facility people <laughs> will not trust you, <laughs> and uh, 
And so, however, if we go to the like basing uh, network, the basin type pro, um, type type of work, so we don't give you the hundred percent of detection. So that will will free free us for the like uh, false alarm. I, I just give you the a list of the possibilities, the uh, and then prioritize the first, the most uh, likely one, and and give you the suggestions you can check something some some of you can easy to check some some faults you do need the people to take a look so that's our uh, uh like uh, procedure thank you uh okay uh, you talked very briefly about control of, of natural ventilation and outdoor air yeah and i'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about what kinds of criteria come into that um okay okay Okay, a uh, very good question and a very hard question. And because the ventilation, uh, if we see, hey, ventilation is just ventilation. If you think that it's easy to control, you are wrong because the ventilation is very hard to control because the wind environments outside a building or outside a house is changing many, uh, seconds. The wind the coefficient, the wind driving coefficients changing uh, like a second. So if we... Purely, uh, so what we want to do is natural ventilation is just open the windows and allow the uh, outside air coming in. And uh, so how can we uh, control the how much uh, uh, outside air, how, how much air coming in, which is hard to, first hard to, hard to measure, second hard to control. Because if we come up with a strategy like we want to, we want like 100, 100 CFM uh, flow come from the window, we can, I cannot guarantee I get that. I can, con I can, I can open the window, but at, at what uh, uh, degree it is the 100, 100 CFM? We cannot measure because the winds, you cannot uh, using sensors, which is an like, um, impossible uh, problem to measure. And uh, so what we usually, as an uh, engineer or as an architect, we, what we usually do, we add some equipment. Um, either add some fans on the uh, small fans on the window, or add some small fans or like uh, uh, the chimneys, the wind chimneys in the building. We have some like fans on that chimney, so they we the uh, the fan will suck the flow in fr uh, uh, from the outside. Then we can control the fans to control the uh, to control the flow. So we, we to guarantee we get that. Uh, uh, purpose. So, what you, I, I asked a very general question, and what you talked about was very interesting and challenging. I was actually thinking of the opposite side of it, which is mm -hmm. supposing that you have a system that can control the flow, mm -hmm. how do you decide when you want uh, additional okay. outside air and when you want to? Okay, okay, outside? okay. Uh, the first the one is when I need is a depend on the occupant we need uh oxygen we need the fresh air first second one is about the indoor air quality we need to dilute the flu uh, pollutant the third one or nah, the the third the, the, the third one is about the energy consumption if uh, here uh, at summer um the outside air temperature is cold and the room temperature because of the people because of the equipments the inside temperature is very high so then we can use the free cooling to just open the like everybody does just open the window. So we're gonna do that. Uh, just open the window to see uh, we can save energy. Does humidity also factor into that? Uh, yeah, which is a very yeah, it's a very good question. The humidity affects this, but usually people do the electric ventilation and uh, use a like. Uh, Another like a distributed system, another system to control the the the, uh, the humidity. If we have like another like the humidifier for the, because you if you don't have the uh, equipment purely use the natural ventilation, you can you can just use other um, systems to dehumidify that or humidify that. But if you have like um, um, uh, air conditioning system, you can. Uh, Control the humidity better to dehumidify that. Which uh, this is a very good question, but uh, for the puny, 
uh, natural ventilation work right now, people do not consider humidity very much. Yeah. But if this area is too, too humi humid, people will not suggest to use the, uh, to, to use the uh, natural ventilation, which is a big problem. Because if you want to add a another uh, humidifier, which is uh, very costly, I'm sorry. <coughs> there, uh, another question before. You talked about short-term energy storage to smooth out uh, the demand um, right. by the hour, so right. um, for heat or cold. Um, do you see any potential for longer-term storage, like also um, right. over a week or maybe even <laughs> seasonal? Yes, yes. Uh, this is a question that my supervisor asked me at Harvard, uh, I think, two months ago. Um, <laughs> um, right now, we, if we want to store that for weeks, we can use uh, like, uh, actively the equipment, like the chilled water or tank or ice tank. We can store that. You can have better like, uh, installations for that tank. But for the passive, if we want to store that like, for a week, for, for week for the building, uh, you, you cannot. You can just for take hours to release that uh, the heat. But use some like phase change material. You do can store that longer, but I think just for days, not for weeks. So, which is a very good question and very challenging. Maybe the people in material side can help us come up with some new materials that we can store the heat for seasons. We can store the heat in summer and release that in the winter. <laughs> that will be a huge, huge contribution to the world, I think. Okay. Yeah, a related question. So I understand the approach of demand response in buildings or appliances or whatever as a way to smooth out the demand and to use the energy when it's least in demand. Right. And so from a cost point of view, I fully understand why that would make, it would be good for the consumer. It would mean we would have to build less power plants because we right. could use them in the downtime and exactly. level off peak demand and all the rest of it. Right. I got a harder time seeing how that sort of thing would result in reducing the energy requirement by, say, twofold. Right. And so I wasn't quite sure. In fact, at one point, you started to say, say energy demand, and then you went to cost. So help me understand for demand response, or for that matter, battery energy storage, mm -hmm. is this mostly a cost thing, or does it actually it's substantially mostly reduce the energy consumed? Actually, for cost. We, if we use storage, no matter what kind of storage you used, you actually not lo lose energy. There are energy loss. You cannot save energy, actually. You can only firstly save energy cost, but also save the, uh, reduce the uh, stress to the power grid. Oh, yes. Yeah, so just going back to the original number, at one point early in the talk, you talked about you know, two-fold reduction in energy. Was that energy cost or energy use? Which two-fold? You mentioned the building energy use could be reduced in half, I think. Oh, yeah. Was that the, speaking the, of cost or was that? that that's for the energy consumption, because that is, that is not a demand response project. OK, it's mostly other mechanisms. Right, yes, it such is. Such as? Just, I mean, so such, as such as turn off the uh, air conditioning. Right. If you or just <laughs> just, go, just go to the uh, extreme point, but such as you, because um, firstly for the occup uh, occupant comforts, which is a range, which is not just one point, you can divert a little bit, and in the summer you can increase the temperature set points a little bit, and to save the cooling energy, right? And uh, to and what what else? And for the Control of the ventilation, like you we mentioned, using natural ventilation, we using the free cooling, and the heating. Uh, for heating, we use uh, we control the temperature set point as well. We have a lot of students here. Do you have any questions, students? I think he has. There's yeah, no. I had a question about like the scale of your microgrid that you were talking about. Okay. Um, because you were talking about island operation of the right. microgrid. Right. Right. How big do you see this microgrid? Um, there, there, not actually. There, there's no building, just tents for. I think just multiple, uh, five or five or ten small tents, and uh, there are some uh, like because uh, that from from the military, uh, and uh, and some like two or three electrical vehicles, okay. and some lighting system. It's a small microgrid without um, integrated with the real building. Okay. 
so so you're talking about like more mobile right. situation. Right, right, exactly. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So you, you mentioned um, you're getting kind of user input like in terms of kind of like user comfort, right, as kind of one of your variable, and it's a range. Right. right. So, I mean, that it's, since it's a very subjective thing, right, right. right. And you're giving and you have a big range, so given any system, there's always the potential to be more efficient because you can always just kind of exactly. you know, uh, sacrifice a little bit of user kind of uh, comfort. But right. how do you yes. then assess because the users are also changing their view, right? Like at any given point in time, right? If they feel a little cold, well, they can change the system by like, opening windows or things like that. Right. Or they can just like put on a coat if they're cold. Exactly. Or take something off. So all of those information is going to make your system design very, very difficult. Exactly. This is the this is the most important and most difficult part right now for the building control is coming from the uh, occupants' behaviors. So um, right now, a lot of projects going on to really to study the occupants' patterns and to uh, how to predict the patterns, how to when uh, they want to put on the clothes or take out the clothes or just have some cold water. Um, when 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 I uh, back uh, like two years ago, I involved in like a survey uh, project, yearly survey uh, project that we ask we survey a whole year of the occupants when they. Uh, which, what kind of, when they um, took all the calls, when they felt warm or when they felt cold and, and turned on the heater, uh, personal heaters, turned on the fans. And the club, uh, with that information and also consider about the building, um, the data from, the information from the building automation system, like the temperature of the building. So we're going like, to uh, have some patterns and have some relationship from between those behaviors and the situations of, of the uh, building environments. So we can consider, consider that in the building design and building op, um, operation. And I said, which is a very, very difficult uh, problem, very su uh, subjective problem right now, okay. which is also my uh, future directions. I want to collaborate with some people from uh, psychology to really to have some contributions on this field. Okay. okay. So, uh, so can I say that your assumption is that all the, all the residents in the building should blindly follow every policy you make? And so, <laughs> so we cannot open the window, and we cannot increase the temperature. We should listen to the high level demand. <laughs> okay, this is one extreme, right? If you for even for the uh, this happen this happen this hap this actually happens in most of the commercial buildings. If you if you in a very large commercial building, you 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 don't have the options. You don't have the control to control change the temperature sets or open the window. This is uh, this is uh, re reality. But however, for residential building, which is another story. Right, we we can give you some suggestions, some guidelines, and some controls. You uh, work with the control strategies. But you, if you don't uh, compile, if you don't follow those guidelines, you're gonna cost more. You cannot uh, get too much. Um, you cannot get uh, like energy savings and or the demand uh, reductions as intended. Right, but we can. We definitely cannot uh, uh, ask okay. the other component okay. blind. So And your current objective function is based on the whole system, yeah. the whole building. Yeah. But for the in individuals, my different. Right. Yeah. Right. Because I buy the air condition, I want to decrease the temperature. Yeah. Is my right? Right. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> you're right. So, this, so it's, mm -hmm. yeah. So we can. Why I need to follow your structure? Okay. So okay. Then, okay. This is good. This is a very good uh, question, but this should be. Um, I think this is another. Th this is another uh, research out of my scope, but I do have some uh, thoughts about this. Yes, you you buy whatever thing you buy, but you can do everything, right? But um, like there are some standards. There are some decrease the building uh, the temperature to what kind of degrees. 
if we can ask, uh, if we can follow uh, have some standards to the equipment, yes, you can. You can change the temperature set points, but the system cannot reach them. This is a, uh, like a, like a possibility. But yes, I totally agree with you. You have the, all the freedom. You can do everything. This is, uh, as I said, this is the most difficult uh, problems right now for the occupants. You can do whatever, right? You can even tear the building down. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for the questions. Thank you.